Welcome to another episode of Just More Fix. This is James. With me this episode is Lacey. Hey. You can find us online at justmorefix.com or on Twitter at Just One More Fix. If you like us, you can support us at patreon.com and you can give us a rating and review at Apple Podcasts or wherever you find us at. In this episode, we're going to talk about trauma in RPGs. And now, it's time to get our gaming fix. I'm Brady Berserker. I'm Big Sexy Brian Bales. And I'm Metal Matson from Super Geeky Playdate. A podcast member of the Gunna Geek Network. Just like the show you're listening to now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual host. Check out all the other podcasts at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. And get ready because geekiness begins in... Three, two, one... Welcome to Just One More Fix. Couple quick announcements here. First off, big thank you to everyone that came out to game on. It's kind of weird to say it that way because it's actually the name of the store, Game, but mm-hmm. also who came to Game to Game to come out for our first indie RPG days at the local gaming store in Terre Haute called Game on South 7th Street. So we had an awesome time there. Carrie ran Blood in the Chocolate and Kurt ran a kind of a modified version of The Quiet Year that was a lot of fun. So. Big thank you to everybody that came out there to game with us. We had a lot of fun, and we will be back there on June 16th, which is Free RPG Day. So we'll be back there running games from 5 to 9-ish or so. So if you are in the Terre Haute or Indiana, Illinois area, and you want to come out and game game with us, we'll be there. Again, it's June 16th from 5 to 9, and that's at the store game in Terre Haute on South 7th Street. I know I'm going to be running 7C Second Edition and maybe some masks, so we'll see how that goes. And there's potential for some other games to be there as well. So we should have at least three different games being ran. So come out, run a game. check us out, and we'll have fun. You think Bedlam Hall? or Probably Bedlam Hall, yeah. Right on. Very cool. Second announcement is that we are lining up some really cool and awesome stuff for Gen Con this year that we're going to do and potential interviews and some of uh, things that we're going to participate in there. So... Lots of fun things there. If you guys are going to be at Gen Con, we're going to do some things there, and maybe we can meet up and hook up with you guys and uh, do some gaming. So there'll be more to come on that as things progress along. And quick note on our Patreon is that Lacey is finishing up her poison chart as we, actually, as we were speaking a minute ago on the uh, pre-show, but also uh, included in that and uh, along with this episode, we're going to do like a trauma chart. So the idea is, is that these will be some symptomology and some uh, words that you can use and sort of roll randomly on a table to pick these three different adjectives to sort of put together conditions and that kind of stuff to use in your game to make the poisons and the trauma more exciting and relevant and use sort of jargony stuff that makes it sound cool and interesting and relevant. (laughs) So should be a good time. Uh, It's kind of inspired by the, the mechanical failure table from, from Firefly, which is a lot of fun because like it have like the, what was it? The coupling, the, it was basically a list of parts and things that could <laughs> that could happen to them. Right. It was super fun, but it added a lot yeah. added a lot to the game for burst, freeze, <laughs> collapse, right. whatever that kind of thing. Compression coils, grav boots. Right. And the last announcement is is that we have finished recording our second session of Night Witches. So all three episodes from the first session of Night Witches are up and out there now to listen to and we have recorded the second session, and I'm in the editing process now. And once that one looks like it's going to break down into three episodes, and those will go up probably bi-weekly again. But as soon as all three of them are done, they will go directly to the Patreon. for the uh, If you support us at Patreon there, that way you can check them out right away and don't have to wait. All right, so quick warning on this one, just so you guys know. We're going to talk about trauma as it relates to RPGs and some of our experience with it, because we see... A fair amount of it, and we're exposed to it in a different way than most people, and we're talking about ways to make it more interesting and more relevant in your RPGs. So if you're squeamish or anything like that, this may not be the episode for you. But if you want to make injuries and trauma more relevant and bring some a different level of intensity and maybe suspense to your games, then hopefully this one's for you. So I guess we're going to start off with... Just a layout of general trauma in RPGs, I feel like it's kind of weak, to be honest, because most RPGs are based off of some kind of a hit point system, and essentially no matter what happens, whether that's a dragon steps on you, or he breathes fire on you, or someone pricks your finger with a a poison needle trap, or any of that stuff, functionally it's all the same. And it's boring. Yeah, you lose a couple hit points. You take 12 hit points. Right. 
You take four damage. You need to describe the damage to your PCs better. And your NPCs for that matter. You know, often you're like, right. gosh, am I even doing anything to this guy? <laughs> Whereas I tell you, uh, you know, you roll an 18 and your sword deals f- five damage and the left shoulder of the creature explodes with black ichor and, you know, whatever. You get the idea. <laughs> right. Adjectives are fun. <laughs> so maybe it's... I guess we're not necessarily advocating to use it for every single goblin sh- that you encounter. Yes, we are. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, or every five damage that you incur. But when there are cool moments where there's a critical hit or something like that, or it's a boss fight and things really matter, or if you're playing a game that's more narrative, when there's just dramatic moments, then you can, our, our goal is to make it to where you can, you, we're going to hopefully give you some tools to make things more exciting, more suspenseful. So, there are a couple games that deal with this pretty well, and one of them is Dark Heresy. And Dark Heresy has... It's got the crit table is right. my favorite part. <laughs> but the crit tables are broken up by body, so it's head, torso, upper extremity, and lower extremity. And then it's broken up even further by damage type. So whether that's a ballistic weapon, a bladed weapon, like a rending weapon, or an explosive weapon, or an energy weapon, and... They are really, really good and descriptive. So if you want some, I guess, either medieval or sci-fi ways to kind of describe things, that is a great resource. And it's in all of their books, whether it's Dark Heresy, Only War, Black Crusade, Rogue Trader, or... Dark Heresy is like the Sin City Death of Watch. RPGs. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's all gray and black and explosive <laughs> violence. <laughs> right. So inside there are some really cool ways to deal with trauma and they deal with it at a mechanical level, but it's only on critical damage, which I think is kind of where we're going to head with this. And also in at least second edition, there were lots of crit tables to roll on. So if you had a critical hit either on your character or you critical hit it on a monster, you could roll hit locations and that kind of stuff. And it had specific, you know, things that might happen, like you put somebody's eye out or they broke an arm or something, and then it would have game effects that way. I also like the idea of like long-term scars. Yeah. Right. So maybe there, maybe there's no mechanical effect in your system once it's completely healed. But how is it interesting is it to go through an epic level D&D campaign and be pretty the entire time? Like, how is it that you don't have some terrible facial scar, a (laughs) shrivelly arm where the dragon burnt you? You know, maybe you still have full range of motion. Jolly good for you. However, wouldn't it be neater? (laughs) Right. Well, scarring is way cool. It kind of shows, like, how much awesome you you have contained in your adventures, right? Very, very relevant. I guess that's kind of a... I mean, think about any book you've ever read that was epic in scale that didn't involve somebody that had some kind of beaten, battered, weathered (laughs) sort of look to them. And on the other side of it, if you end up with a facial scar, you know you're going to become a bad guy. Yeah, team evil. I mean... (laughs) That's how it works. Dragon scarred my face. I'm on evil team now. (laughs) That's actually how dragons recruit. They just, oh, he's a good warrior, slash his face. He's got the mark of the dragon. (laughs) Right, exactly. Done. (laughs) Okay. So I think... Before we get into talking about the actual physicality of trauma, maybe we should talk about how things can be presented, right? So it's kind of astonishing about when you talk about blood loss, which is a factor in a lot of different games. So if you take so many dramatic wounds or critical wounds in Dark Heresy, you face blood loss and death. Burning Wheel has it. There's lots of different games that involve this. sort of there in D&D because you can get to negative hit points right. and you have to make quartitude saves in order mm-hmm. to stabilize and not continue to die. Right. So one thing that was really interesting for me is that when I was going to school to be a paramedic, we did this blood lab thing, which I found really, really cool and amazing is that they took expired blood. And they had like a dozen stations set up and they measured out a specific volume of blood and then they put it into different scenarios. So whether it was like in a in a something like a toilet bowl full of water or they squirted it onto the ground or just all kinds of different amounts of blood sprayed around. And it's really impressive because a little bit of blood goes a long way and it doesn't seem like there. I mean, like you look at something and there it looks like there's a ton of blood there. But in reality, it's not that much. It's really kind of surprising. And at the other top, at the other side of it, there was one of the stations that was like a couch cushion, right? So it's like some kind of foamy cushion. Mm-hmm. And it didn't look like there was a lot, but because it's spongy, it just right, absorbed it, it all. And there was like almost a full pint of blood that they had put into this cushion, and it didn't look like it was hardly anything. So basically the entire lesson of doing the 
exercise was we were way off on estimating blood loss. They weigh pads in the hospital. That that's how you uh, you well, estimate it. That's you, a good... you take you know because you use the same size pads for everybody because it's mm-hmm. all stock warehouse supplies. Right. So you have the dry weight of and then the whatever pad, weight. and then you weigh it when it's wet. Right. And then what, one gram is equal to one milliliter. milliliter. Of blood I think loss, so. I believe. Yeah. So it's what I'm. All I'm getting at is that it wasn't consistently low or consistently high. It was all over the place. This one's way too high. This one's way too low. And it was, I went through and did it with like 25 people and we were all over the place because we didn't tell anybody what we were guessing. You mm-hmm. wrote it down and then they tallied them up and they showed up. Oh, we all suck at this. Basically, that's the entire lesson to learn. So in terms of when you get to describing things, don't be afraid to say that there's just gore everywhere because people are, really. yeah, <laughs> but people are capable of losing incredible amounts of blood loss and surviving, assuming that they're a relatively healthy person, Right. And not compromised in some kind of other way, whether that's age or disease okay. or whatever. Well, I wouldn't say incredible amounts. It will look like incredible yeah, well, yeah, amounts when you spread it at. out. It's not really incredible amounts because <laughs> the whole system mm-hmm. doesn't contain as much as you might think. Right. Well, I guess that's entirely relevant. So the average adult at what was it, 180 a hundred, pounds? No, less than that. About 160 pounds, 150, 160 pounds has about one and a quarter gallons, one and a quarter, one right. and a half of, gallons of blood, of blood. right and that, that's it right so then if you think about maybe a 200 pound person an adult fit adult yeah, male or whatever that, you might have a couple gallons right maybe. you might have two something like that so there's a fair amount there but at the same time not that much not but, compared to your entire body mass like if <laughs> right. i held up two gallons of milk next to you you'd be like oh that's not a lot <laughs> no not at all not at all so and plus i mean if you turn a gallon of milk upside down how fast is that that drain out right yeah it's pretty fast right <laughs> something else to consider that doesn't often get accounted for is that even if you live in a world where there's some kind of magical or scientific healing, whether it's cure lights or cure potions or cure spells or whether you're in some kind of Star Trek or Star Wars world where there's healing tanks and whatever, you still have to survive long enough to get there. So what we're going to talk about is a lot of real world things that people do that involve trauma now and also things that have been done in the past that maybe we don't necessarily do anymore and some of them we still do that will get those people to either that magical healing stage or the back to tank or whatever it is, or if you're just in a regular mundane world where there's no magical healing and you just got to suck it up. I was looking to see how much blood your heart pumps in a minute because I was thinking it was pretty close to total volume. And it's a, it, well, it, it, no, it is. Uh, in one minute, oh. it moves five to seven liters of blood. Mm-hmm. No, I'm, I mean, there's compensatory right. me- you know, mechanisms to... It's about 70 milliliters of squeeze, I think, for an adult, I think is what it is, so... Depending on ejection, but blah, blah, blah. Anyway, time is of the essence is always really getting yeah. with that statement. <laughs> All right. So like I said, magical healing and futuristic medicine can change a lot of these things, but you still have to survive long enough to get there. And I think it's still a fun consequence to consider the mess that you leave behind. So who did you do? You have a magical healing <laughs> spell, but if you were trying to be sneaky and your rogue just bled half of his volume all over this tiny room. <laughs> right. Well, you know, there there goes your leave no trace. <laughs> like <laughs> either you're gonna right. have to take a lot of time to clean that up, or somebody's gonna know that you were here. <laughs> right, absolutely. I didn't even think about that, but right on. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's funny too. Like when there's like scrolls or books in the room. Like how is none of this stuff ever damaged? Covered, yeah. Any, <laughs> well, yeah, especially if you're you know, a, if you're a wizard. Really, right? that magic missile did nothing to all this nice dry paper that's been sitting here. Not <laughs> or, a thing. Or what if you're a wizard and you're reading <laughs> scrolls and spell books? How come they're not bloody thumbprints all <laughs> Meanwhile, over? Meanwhile, there's ogre, just like <laughs> blue green body fluids all everywhere. Over <laughs> right. Uh, all righty so i guess the first thing that comes up is time and this is kind of touches back to the idea of getting to that magical healing or getting to the farce out there science healing medicine whatever it is right so in modern day medicine we have this thing called the golden hour and the idea is is that from the minute you're injured you have an hour to be at some sort of definitive care, whether that's and that's under the surgeon's knife to fix the problem. That's not to the ER. That's that's not to the to the ambulance. That's to a person who's actually doing surgery to fix your problem. Okay, and survivability goes way up if you are at trauma services within an hour, essentially. So it's a long time, but it's really it's not. Fun. Yeah. 
if you're in a world like a fantasy world where you don't have cars <laughs> or rocket ships or teleporting or something, that's a that's a long way. You figure three miles an hour is the average walking speed. So if you're three miles from a town, you're probably three miles from any significant healing mechanisms unless you have a cleric with you. That's a big deal. Basically, what I'm hearing is always have a cleric. Yes, this is the lesson here. There's always no make cleric sure. in your party. You've had an error. In Go judgment. back to town, to the tavern, <laughs> and hire a cleric. Choices. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> that does not mean a wand of cure light wounds or load up on potions. Do both of those things, but bring an actual cleric with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. There's a whole lot to say about that, but time is of the essence, and it is probably one of the most important factors that you're going to fight. Outside of immediate blood loss when it comes to trauma, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it becomes more relevant outside of the D&D &D realm because we all know, you know, you continue to roll the die and after so many rounds and rounds go one, like in a second. Yeah, it's three seconds a round or whatever. So, yeah, once you get down to zero, there, or I think it's either zero or negative five. five. I can't remember what they changed it to. Five. And then you... Uh, that could be old system, though. What yeah. do I know? <laughs> and then you have the potential to, to bleed out, essentially. So in I, five seconds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But well, no, that'd be five rounds, three seconds a round. That'd oh, be, three seconds a round. Okay. 15 seconds. 15 seconds. My bad. I've, I've shorted you 10 seconds of life. Right. Which is a little fast, but... <laughs> I don't know. A minute is what they usually say, but... I don't know what night five actually translates into an actual... That's true. You know, it's I abstracted. Mean, that, so. that feels very battered to <laughs> yeah. me. Oh, it definitely is. They say, like, from significant trauma, you know, like, immediate blood loss is about 60 seconds you can bleed out and to, to un, not surviving anymore. There are some other systems where I, I think time becomes more of an interesting factor than D&D. &D. Like your any World of Darkness system, anything set in the modern era where there's actually a possibility of transporting someone there and then the struggle to try and keep things under control <laughs> long enough to, to get to that destination. Right. Um, well, and that just, just to lay this out there for everyone, average response time for an ambulance nationwide is nine minutes, which when you have 60 to burn, nine is a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's not, that's like nine minutes from someone calls to when someone gets there. So then they've got to do everything, get you in the truck and then get to the hospital, which you're looking at another 15 minutes maybe on scene and then another six, seven minutes, depending on where you're at. If you're out in the middle of nowhere, like it's some kind of Cthulhu ritual happening, right? <laughs> right. Maybe you're looking at 20 minutes because I've, I've had lights and sirens hauling ass to the hospital, 25 minute transports if you're way out in the county and there's nothing around. And then if you go down to like Texas and you get even more rural, ooh, you're talking like 35, 45 minutes. And that may not be to a real hospital. That's to a Band-Aid station. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? So, And if you're playing in an especially dark system... Yeah, I encourage you by all means set a timer for ten minutes and make your players come up with <laughs> yeah. something to do. Well, for that's 10 actually, minutes. <laughs> it's something interesting that Lamentations does with a lot of their adventures is a lot of their stuff is timed so that when ten minutes of actual gameplay happens, you do this. When there's thirty minutes, you do this. And I think it's something interesting to incorporate because it adds another level of suspense. So if you have a character or maybe an NPC, an important NPC who you have to they have to survive, setting some kind of a timer where this is how much time you have to get things done. It adds another level of suspense and drama to everything that could potentially go wrong. All right, so I guess maybe we should just kind of walk this through the process. So we talked about response times and this kind of stuff, right? So then... So outside of actual just waiting on a professional to get there, there are, of course, some things that most lay people would know to do in order to stop imminent catastrophe, like putting pressure on the wound. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everybody's at the point now where they know that. But maybe you have whatever your your game system equivalent of the cleric is, a, a medic, a doctor, right. a, a, a druid, God a help heal you. skill. <laughs> <laughs> right. A heal check, yeah. Right. But there's, there's a couple easy, quick, interesting tools that we actually have today. So the first one for major blood loss is tourniquet. And I know a lot of people... I like how you say today, like that hasn't been around well, for a okay. long ass time. You're right. <laughs> but uh, there is some interesting research that has come out recently because of most of our research for trauma stuff comes from the military. And they have found now that you can have a trauma or a tourniquet applied to a, an, ex an extremity for up to eight hours without any negative effects to the limb. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not painful on the limb because it cuts off blood flow, there's nerve pain, all this kind of stuff. But ultimately, eight hours without any significant loss of... Uh, er function. Function. In addition, you know, like outside of the, the, the trauma that's already happened or whatever, which is really pretty interesting and crazy. So 
And they have all kinds of really cool tourniquets now. They're like one-handed cat tourniquets that you can spin on. They sort of go on in Velcro and you can do with one hand. So they're really cool and they are super, super effective. So there are some really interesting, cool tools out there. The other interesting tool that's new now is there is quick clock gauze that is out there that like you can pack a wound with it and... I saw a demonstration where they they did a two inch laceration into the femoral artery, uh, you know, like a um, like simulated or whatever, right? And they didn't actually. I, I would hope so. <laughs> Who's the volunteer? <laughs> Don't raise your hand, right. right? But they they packed that. It was so it's a two inch clean laceration with like a utility knife, right? And they packed that wound and had it completely stopped within i think it was like 60 or 70 seconds and that's from like we cut it and now i open the package and i start packing right they also do some stuff with uh factor seven clotting is the agents. powder um i'm not sure exactly how is it administered um i i know they they have for people like with hemophilia mm-hmm. and other bleeding disorders where it's an injection so okay. I, I don't know but i would assume it would be the same thing except you don't have an underlying disorder they're just giving it because you're bleeding massively right and um and then there's the change from giving just red blood cells to giving actual whole blood, whole blood right. because as it turns out, your body sort of has that mixture finely tuned, right? And perhaps monkeying with it is not the best option. <laughs> right on. Um, but in the gaming system, if you're if you're in a, a modern world, you could certainly have your players try to make some kind of role to sort of jerry rig some some blood administration from one player to the next that could lead to some interesting uh (laughs) possibilities right well and it's something you see in a lot of movies too where there's uh, take my blood take my blood exactly i'm all negative he's my brother whatever the case may be (laughs) right but it, it could set up some cool moments where maybe you have a character or an npc who's important and they are down and at that zero hit point level or critical damage level or whatever it is and you have a player there who says, I'm going to give them blood. So then maybe they take off hit points to add to their saving throw to resist death or whatever mm-hmm. it is, however you want to work that out. But that could be a really cool thing to try and manage. And like, how do you do that? And how do you put that together? And how much risk is the player willing to put out there to add to their save? Right. Mm-hmm. And that's a cool thing. And then assuming they do live. That adds for some that that shapes up for some really cool role playing moments later. Like I gave I very nearly died to save your life. There's some really cool things that could happen there because, as we know, events happen, things get complicated, betrayal, blah 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 blah, whatever <laughs> you know. Especially like if you're in a world of darkness situation or whatever, right? Well, yeah, the the whole blood bond. I mean, that's been around in vampire for well, a yeah, long time. Yeah. Like, but like I'm if, going to bring him back. Oh God, what have I done? Right. But like if you're in a changeling game or a mage game where healing is doesn't exactly isn't as as easy as it is in Werewolf or Vampire, there's mm-hmm. some cool potential there. Or if you're in a in a fake game, there's a lot of ways you could sort of work that in there too. Back on the old school tactics, there's always good old cauterization. Most people are <laughs> yeah. familiar with that as well. Yeah. For those of you that don't know, it's when you get something really hot and then you poke the wound with it, <laughs> essentially, and you burn the wound to, to sear the it's flesh. good for cleaning. It's good for stopping <laughs> yeah. bleeding. It's good for everything. In theory. <laughs> hey, it is it is still a technique used. Yeah, that's true. Today, yeah, mostly for, you know, nosebleeds, but whatever. <laughs> they use it in surgery, too. You can cauterize things. All right, so there's a the only other thing I'll mention is this thing called the Israeli bandage. It's a modern piece of equipment that you can use. It's sort of like a tourniquet or pressure dressing, essentially. So you can just Google any of these. Google cat tourniquet, that's C-A-T tourniquet, or Israeli bandage, or quick clot, quick clot gauze. There's all kinds of different cool tools that you can use. And maybe... Uh, are we not going to talk about the mass trousers? You know you want to. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll get there. Hang on. So... <laughs> There's there's lots of cool things that you can just Google and look at them, and it might give you some cool tools to describe the way your healers or medics are treating wounds to make it more than just, oh, he applies the bandage. Because that's, that's boring. That's not suspenseful, right? If you think of war movies or intense action movies where somebody's banged up or shot up or whatever, those moments with those main characters where they're on the verge of dying are much more intense than just saying, I apply the bandage. I made my first aid roll. That's, is, it, is it sad that I'm thinking about Tropic Thunder right now and holding <laughs> up the ridiculous hands? Right. <laughs> no, that's a perfect example. It's like if you're in more of a comedy game, you know, it's totally relevant. <laughs> you know, it's a great, it's a great maybe Spirit of 77 moment, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally could be, right? <laughs> right on. Do you want to talk about mass trousers or do you want me to talk about the disaster that they are? 
Well, you, you, you go ahead. Okay. I'll, I'll let you jump right in there. <laughs> I just feel like they bear mentioning because, like, it, it's one of, it's a perfect example of something that's not good, practical no, at decent all. Decent engineering versus actual real world <laughs> application. Okay. So there's this <laughs> thing, they're called mass trousers or mass pants. And if you had a person who had a significant trauma, the idea was is that when the ambulance arrived, the paramedics would put you in these pants, and they're like these giant pants that fit anybody, and then they inflated them, essentially. <laughs> and the idea was, like, everybody knows this thing about shock where, oh, he's going into shock, lift his feet, you know, that whole bit, right? The idea being that it actually – gravity will pull more of the blood volume to your heart, lungs, and brain and the more vital parts of you. You keep the blood in the core That's was the, was the that's idea. That's the idea. So it's kind of that idea, except imagine if you were to squeeze it and it was just to do it more. But as it turns out, they were so inconvenient to put on and so terrible and and just awful to deal with. It's just one more thing to do in this giant mess of a disaster where people are bleeding everywhere and there's all kinds of trouble. It's just a waste of time. It really, really just is. So I guess just to say that if you're playing in a game that is before evidence-based medicine... <laughs> <laughs> right that there are all kinds Not of too long before though <laughs> yeah there are all kinds of goofy goofy techniques and stuff that that people have done it's sort of amazing that we just survived despite our bone best efforts essentially is what it is right i don't really know that they're relevant i just find them amusing and i felt like we should mention them <laughs> i hate them i'm very <laughs> thankful that they don't exist anymore at least on my end of things because they're just a nightmare to deal with but just know that there are train wrecks that happen on those scenes uh, when you're trying to use equipment that is designed by someone who has never actually had to do the job, essentially. Well, I mean, I just if anyone has ever tried to put pants on someone oh, else yeah, well. at all, <laughs> especially someone who's unconscious or uncooperative. Right. And now imagine doing that in a high stretch situation where things are also slippery and or sticky and or sharp or <laughs> right. It's just any number of other issues. Not ideal. And then they're inflatable. So inevitably people have scissors and they're cutting clothes and things off to be able to look at you to make sure where your injuries are. So sometimes straps and the pants get cut. Sometimes there's glass from shattered windows that get put in there and that gets popped. And then usually the ER staff doesn't know how to take them off. So maybe they cut straps they're not supposed to. It's just a train wreck. So. My tirade of mass pants is over, so I'm I'm done. I'm done talking about them. They Screw are, you, pants. They are a terrible thing. <laughs> they should never come back. Yeah. Also, it's just an interesting thing, I guess, along with that, with techniques and things that we use in, in, in modern medicine have changed. So everybody is used to seeing people get put in sea collars and on backboards for car accidents. But now we almost backboard nobody because... Sea collars are still a thing, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... As it turns out, only like one in 5,000 people that are involved in a significant mechanism injury actually have a spinal injury. So like there's – just know that there's lots of things that change and – And if you care to Google the current era that you're setting your game in, you may find an interesting or quirky thing to throw in there as a fun yeah. little curveball. <laughs> so lots of wonkiness and goofiness. And plus that people make terrible mistakes when they're under stress anyway. So <laughs> if something's wrong and your players call you on it, just be like, I don't know. He was bad at his job. <laughs> He's Pins. having a bad day. Meister Nightshade. That's right. It's <laughs> three in the clock in the morning. He's been on the roads, you know, for 20 hours now. People make mistakes. That's how it works. All right. Moving on. We talked about some actual treatments, and that was more stuff that happens before you get to the hospital. Is there anything you want to talk about with the hospital and, and things that you guys do once the patients get there besides specific? Well, it's like a, more of a modern thing, really. Well, I mean, we were kind of doing a little research in the actual sort of trauma setup to, to to be an organized trauma unit doesn't really come about until about the Korean War era. Mm -hmm. And then they, they go to having actual a system in place for we pick patient up here, we have these services, we take him to this place, and now mm -hmm. they see the trauma surgeon and this and this and this. So we've gone from that to having uh, several trauma centers uh, across the country. Mm -hmm. And so now if it's a trauma patient, it, you know, let's say the, the nearest trauma center is 15 to, you know, even 30 minutes farther away than this hospital, you would still go to the trauma center right. because the amount of time it takes to get them to an actual mm -hmm. surgeon is so significantly less. And trauma centers also, by design, have more than just 
trauma surgeons. Right. They also have orthopedic doctors. They have neurologists. They have mm-hmm. cardiologists. They have every kind of ologist pretty much under the sun mm-hmm. in order to treat patients with significant um, significant injuries. Right. And that's our guideline is any if if it's within an hour. So if you are within an hour of an actual level one or level two trauma center, which are your major trauma centers, you're supposed to go directly there and bypass whatever small hospital you're you're around. Unless they're imminently dying and you're going to have to do CPR. So, well, and people always jump immediately to grotesque amounts of bleeding, but there's also burn injuries, mm-hmm. explosions from chemical chemical mm-hmm. exposures, head injuries, neck and back things are, are big as well. You know, any kind of big bone injury, abdominal trauma that may not look like much abdominal, sorry, so stomach for those of you that aren't yeah. you know, anatomy wise or whatever, but you get hit with something in the stomach really hard, sometimes people are a little fluffy. You may not see a problem at Mm -hmm. first. And the first signs that may show up are just your patient not looking right or not feeling well. And then all of a sudden, your belly is hard as a board and you Mm -hmm. have a significant problem because as it turns out, your your stomach cavity can hold quite a lot of blood. (laughs) There's actually, when when you bring people in, if they have sort of concerns for internal bleeding, they look in a couple spots in your abdomen because generally it pools in those areas. And I was told that you can hold up to two liters of volume in your abdomen without, you know, it will just pool there inside of you and you may not even realize it. Well, we know. I mean, female population gets pregnant. Mm -hmm. There's a whole eight pound baby plus fluid plus whatever, and your organs just kind of move aside to accommodate for that expanse. Right. Uh, So that's definitely an area for problems. So for for stuff like that, there's usually um, ultrasound. Mm-hmm. So That's, you can, yeah, they, you know, kind of immediate imaging to see what's going on inside there to get a rough idea of how bad the problem right. is, and and that's just to give you an idea that you may ha- you could have a patient or, or a, a a character, a victim, an NPC, whatever, who doesn't look terribly blown to bits or cut up or banged up or whatever, but is still in very very significant danger from blood loss, and they may not look. So if you're if you're looking for a way to challenge your players, <laughs> or maybe they failed a role and you're busy thinking about massive trauma where an arm is missing, and okay, well that would be super obvious. There's no way even on a one you would miss the fact that this guy has blood squirting out of an absent left arm. Right. But maybe you miss that, or maybe you miss you know like a chest injury, and now there's a lung that's not working, or something like that, something more disguised. So I think that kind of leads us into distracting injuries, which is something you mentioned. So, <laughs> uh, distracting injuries. <laughs> yes, everybody has has well, not everybody, but a lot of people have heard the term "life over limb." But sometimes limb injuries can be a lot more obvious than things that are imminently life threatening. So the things we mentioned about head injuries already, neck and back injuries, belly injuries, chest injuries, those are all very can have the potential to be very serious. Whereas the fact that, you know, my my wrist or arm is just looking very terrible may not be what's most concerning to you right now, but it's definitely very distracting. It's bleeding everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then there are other things that can be distracting as well. Just other people around or the the very person that is injured may be telling, no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, go back. The adrenaline is still working. Or maybe you don't know them and you're trying to help them and they're cussing you this way and that because they've just been stabbed or shot or whatever. And you, you have to try and wrangle that and still treat them. But uh, probably my favorite distraction, (laughs) because it is immediately like, oh, is something gross that you have to deal with in order to get to the injury. So maybe uh, your person has had, you know, vomit everywhere. (laughs) Maybe your person has had just diarrhea everywhere. (laughs) And I've heard the story of of one of those where, you know, a a patient had a central line that had had come out and he had gotten up out of bed and fallen down and he was just covered in in crap, basically. Mm -hmm. And so people went in, they're trying to get him cleaned up and nobody's paying any attention to the fact that the central line is pulled out and now he's bleeding everywhere. By the time they figure it out, his blood pressure is like 70 something all because they were distracted by poop <laughs> or um, maggots. 
maggots are a terrible, disgusting thing that can happen in wounds, and they are very distracting. They smell god awful, right? And there may be a very and in fact, if you're to the point where there's maggots, I guarantee you there is a significant problem happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you maybe just haven't quite found it yet because you're too concerned about the fact that someone is literally crawling with other. Mm-hmm. Insects and living organisms. Well, we, we have a term called splinting to death that involves distracting injuries. So you mentioned like deformed limbs and that kind of stuff, and it's very obvious. So when it's staring you in the face, see problem, fix problem, and, and people begin to splint arms or legs or do whatever. And meanwhile, there are larger problems happening that you may not have noticed, but you're so focused on splinting this arm or leg or whatever that you have, you know, let the person sort of start down this spiral of trouble because you're so focused on something that just glares you in the face that may look bad, but a lot of times isn't actually life threatening. Like broken bones look bad, but for the most part, if you're a healthy adult, it's not that big a deal. You will survive. You well, and know? The, the big thing they are always drilling into m- medical professionals' heads at, at basic trauma courses is roll your patient over and look, yeah, look at, at their, their back, back. Yeah. because they may have some terrible bleeding wound that you haven't seen yet because you're too mm-hmm. worried with the fact that their arm is bending in a way that should not happen. Right, right. Or exit wounds. If you're talking like RPGs, there's a lot of gunshots that happen whether you're playing Shadowrun or Call of Cthulhu or, or any number of games with guns in them. People get shot in the front and sometimes the bullets come out the back, <laughs> right? So you may be focused on the front and bandaging the front. And meanwhile, all of all of our volume of blood is leaking out the back <laughs> no matter what you do. So there's a lot of components to it. And I don't, there's – I guess the only big thing to realize is even as people that deal with this at a professional level as often as you're going to in that sort of world, there's still large margins of error – because it's so subjective and it's so distracting and uh, your adrenaline is up and all that kind of stuff. So just consider that when you're – especially if your players are involved in a combat where they're participating in the combat and their friend is now banged up. So they've got the adrenaline rush from trying to survive and on their own and then someone in their group goes down because they've been shot up or cut up or whatever it is. And now they've got to deal with that as well. So there's a lot of potential there for – distraction and danger and missed things. And I guess people fail their roles all the time. And one of the inspirations for us doing this is that in those failed roles, there's a lot of potential there. And it isn't necessarily to be punitive against your players, but it is to say that when that role fails, you can make that much more interesting than, oh, you failed, lose two more hit points, Mm -hmm. right? Your patient continues to bleed. Maybe instead of, of that, right. you fail the role. Oh, there's this other injury you never noticed in the first place. Right. That oh, kind of thing. And also, if you describe how, how bad the situation is looking, then it becomes a real debate for your players. Do we stay here and continue to fight? Do do Does half the party continue to fight and then I try and take care of our comrade who's down because things look so bad? How do you negotiate that and what do you do? And – I think those things are the cool moments of role play where do you dis- – what decision do you make? There may not be a right decision in those cases and a lot of times there's not. But those moments where you have to weigh that decision and you can look at your players and be like – you can see them debating. Do we stop to help you or does that put us all in too much risk because the dragon is going to squash us and breathe on us or, or whatever right. the situation is? I think that's why Mashed is so cool too because it, it puts you right in that situation of – Okay, do I keep going with this patient when then there are these other ones I yeah. haven't even seen yet where potentially more things could be going wrong? Okay, so for those of you that don't know, uh, we reviewed MASH and you can go back and check it out. And it is an amazing Power by the Apocalypse game. So it's a game about the Korean War and you don't play soldiers in the war. You play <laughs> you play people that are involved in the MASH unit, the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. And you're not putting people back together completely. You're putting them back together enough to get them to the hospital where they can get like actual definitive surgery done to 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 put them back together completely, right? And they call it meatball surgery. So part of the the drama of that game and I've seen it play out uh, at Hoosier Con when I ran it there and I've seen it play out at our table is that there are three patients outside waiting on you and you're working on the patient who's on the table now and they have lots of injuries and do I just decide to amputate this leg and move on so I can get to the next patient because if I don't that's more time I spend here more resources I spend here and the people waiting for for to go under the knife are 
declining because of time. What's one of the moves that the, that the MC can make is that if you succeed at a cost or even fail, they can uh, advance the trauma clocks on the wounds on the patients waiting to come in. And it's very interesting to see the mental chess that happens between what do I do? How do I manage this? Because it's, it's not easy, you know, and they're just, you know, not nameless NPCs, but they're people that don't necessarily matter to the overall plot every time. But it is interesting to watch players go through that, that uh, mental exercise for what losses are they willing to accept and consequences of it or whatever. So it's, that's a very cool game. If you're interested or, or involved in medicine at all, mashed is definitely worth checking out because it presents some cool potential role-playing and, um, moments and all that stuff it's a great game it's a lot of fun so all right anyway well do you want to talk about some period things that they used to do in terms of cures and treatments for trauma oh we kind of did that on the way a little bit a little little bit there's a couple we didn't mention though is that trepidation oh yeah yeah for uh to relieve intracranial pressure yeah (laughs) so it's actually not that different than what's still happening, no, if we're no, being it's, perfectly it's honest. Scary. Um, so trepidation would be drilling a hole through someone's skull in order to alleviate pressure inside their brain, uh, presumably from bleeding. Mm-hmm. And it's actually something that can still be done in major head trauma. Yeah. They take out a portion of the skull and basically make a little window so that your brain has room to expand and swell without killing you. <laughs> and they just sort of like incubate that little piece of skull somewhere else and then Usually they in your belly. <laughs> you know, pop it back on there when the time comes and it's pretty crazy Bob's your uncle there you go <laughs> <laughs> right it's it's unbelievable to be honest but yeah i don't know it's, it's incredible and they've been doing that since the roman times there was a roman a roman surgeon that was doing it to gladiators that's actually documented Galland. There's, Yeah, there's actual cases where he did it and it worked and the people survived and it's unbelievable that they didn't die of infection which is a whole nother problem that comes up in in non-sterile environments is that whether you're shot or stabbed or whatever if you imagine the worst troglodyte running around through whatever nasty swamp and icker he's digging through and he's got some sort of makeshift machete short sword short sword thing and he runs it into your abdomen chances are you're probably going to die of infection afterwards you know it's kind of anticlimactic and no one wants to play D and D the reality, but it it if you fail the fortitude save, that's because of poison or infection or whatever. That's what's going to happen to you is you're going to get this infection inside you, and it could be awful and lethal. So just keep that in mind, especially if you're playing in games in a Victorian thing or a steampunk thing or caught Trail of Cthulhu in the twenties. There's well, nineteen twenties is before doctors are even washing their hands between patients, <laughs> which is unbelievable to think. So. Modern medicine is kind of scary. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know? by the 1860s, we're at least routinely using anesthetics. Well, hooray! If you're injured in, in the early 1800s... <laughs> Forget about it, yeah. Bite the stick yep. and hope for the best. Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> Maybe drink some liquor. One thing I, I hadn't known before uh, when we started looking into this is that the Greeks and actually uh, kind of ancient Chinese used to use a version of ephedrine in treating wounds to cause uh, the blood vessels to tighten down and mm-hmm. reduce bleeding, which is really interesting. And maybe if you have a character who's got the, the right mix of herbs and spices available, right. you could you could whip up some kind of concoction to... A, a poultice, if yeah, you will. Yeah, some, some sort of poultice <laughs> to, uh, to help coagulate things. Right on. Amputation has been a thing for a long, long time and continues today for people that have really, um, what they call that, comminuted fractures where their their bone is just pulverized and there's no no chance of healing it. But it's been a thing since ever where they might just cut it off. I know the That's hot... the thing, right? Like stop the bleeding. Is the limb salvageable? Are you able to stop the bleeding? The answer to those questions is no. You, you cut it off and, and you, you start anew. <laughs> right. And it's really kind of amazing because fundamentally the way it's done hasn't changed in a long time there's there's a technique to it and everything else but stop bleeding replace volume (laughs) yeah but like the actual act of of amputation isn't any different now than it was no the tools are all the same they're just sterile now (laughs) yeah there's this specific knife that they use to kind of shape (laughs) like a question mark and a bone saw (laughs) yeah you know, it's it's pretty incredible, there's drills, actually. There's, I mean, mm-hmm. hammers. There's surgical hammers, for God's sake. Yeah. 
the interesting that when I I did some time with the, in the OR and they were like the only difference between these tools and the ones in your toolbox is how they're made in a sterile environment and essentially that's it that's the only difference and then theirs can go in an autoclave and be sterilized <laughs> that's really I guess fundamentally they're all stuff that you would already potentially have it's simple just, hand tools yeah yep all right so I don't know there's a there's a lot there and we kind of jumped around but one thing I thought might be interesting to talk about is non humans. And how things might be different for them. So like halflings are very small and in theory wouldn't be capable of surviving uh, the same kind of traumas that an adult human would be. And maybe even elves because they're supposed to be slighter and that kind of stuff. Maybe a little bit less than a human while dwarves are supposed to be very stout and hardy. And gnomes. You forgot gnomes. No, I didn't. Yep. No. Pretty, pretty sure. <laughs> yes. You forgot no. So I don't know. They might be somewhere between the human and the elf. Maybe I don't know. They're a little. Well, and in the newer system of D and D, you have tieflings and mm-hmm. uh, what's the angelic version? Asimir, maybe. I can't remember. Whatever. But th- there's a potential there that the actual inner anatomy could be right completely different. I well, suppose that's possible with hobbits and dwarves too. You, I think theirs would be pretty. Don't really similar. talk about it. You you would think, but you but know. maybe orcs might orcs and goblins might be significantly different, or kobolds depending on whether they're draconic or dog like in your world or whatever. There's some interesting potentials there if you wanted to get into the weeds about maybe your human cleric and his heal ability is more suited to humanoid. Style mm-hmm. creatures as opposed to orcs or troglodytes or lizard men or whatever it is. It could be a really fun way to find out that something's askew in a Trail of Cthulhu game. Perhaps oh, you're yeah, doing an autopsy on a on a uh, washed up member of the Insmith uh, <laughs> clan there, and right. uh, all of a sudden, wait a second, humans don't have an air bladder. What's happening here? <laughs> <laughs> right, that would be really cool. It'd be kind of an interesting way to deliver some of those cl- those core clues or whatever you know, on a Trail of Cthulhu or Call of Cthulhu, Call of Cthulhu sense. Um, I, I'm a big fan of using medical examiners and, and autopsies in Trail of Cthulhu and Call of Cthulhu games. It's a lot of fun. And the fear that players have when there's a uh, an autopsy or medical examination going on of the uh, the body reanimating is aw- – even if you have never have that intention of doing it, just they're like they're- – I mean I feel a little bit like that. <laughs> At work. <laughs> this is true. If you let me into the morgue, I'm like giving sideways glances like, you better not move. <laughs> Once we call this thing, you're done. After that, if you get back up, <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> Connex mm. seems like a pretty natural one too. Aliens and whatnot. Oh, yeah. Alien anatomy. <laughs> Whether that's like Atlanteans or gray aliens or the, um, I can't think what they're called, but the, the, the lizard people that can shape change mm-hmm. the humans. So, yeah, there's some really cool potential there as well. So lots of cool ideas. I don't know. Hopefully this helps you in your descriptions or ideas that you have for for trauma cases in your or trauma cases <laughs> for injured people <laughs> in your in your RPGs. <laughs> but just know that people will survive incredible injuries sometimes. And at the same time, sometimes they will just not survive the what is the most seemingly innocuous injury. There's almost no rhyme or reason to it sometimes. So if your characters say, man, I can't believe he survived, well, that stuff happens. And it's just crazy and unbelievable sometimes, right? This really lends itself well to a Game of Thrones game where <laughs> people just keel over left and right. And right. Folks like, yeah. What happened? Uh, well, Robert Baratheon, right, dies from the injury from the boar because yeah. he gets an infection yep. from it. So it's not even like the immediate injury. It's just mm-hmm. the fact that it's come, welcome to the pre-antibiotic era. Right. Or it, what's awesome, that could be a cool way to incorporate a failed heel role. So a person is in character or NPC, important NPC is injured. Your cleric or healer character makes their heal roll. They fail it, right? But you say, oh, no, you did it just fine. It's okay. Yeah. The they're failing good. time bomb. <laughs> exactly. And then they take them back and they're laying there, laid up in bed, trying to heal. And lo and behold, uh, they got gangrene and now they're septic and now they die, <laughs> right? It's just a cool moment to add some incredible drama and complications to to a game. Uh, we'd re- reference Master, Master Nightshade from our Poison episode because that truly – sent the game on an awesome epic spiral that was completely unintended (laughs) and the fallout from that was just awesome so i think the succeed at a cost in your apocalypse world style games or powered by the apocalypse stuff is really cool where they might make the the success part is that they treat the injuries but the at a cost would be that things are more complicated or they don't notice the distracted they they get 
not that they don't notice, they focus on the distracting injuries maybe or something like that. There's some really cool potential there if you play it right, I think. But less is more sometimes. If you press this out, maybe you need to wait a couple, three, four sessions before you do it again. Mm-hmm. Or use it on your more meaningful NPCs. Yeah, yeah. Save, save it up for... For the interesting folks. <laughs> right, yeah. If you're playing Dark Heresy and it's the uh, Imperial Guard soldier number five, don't bust out the cool adjectives and, and potential problems on him. Wait till it's someone that matters. So, no. true that. True that. <laughs> Ron, would you have anything else for this one or no? Uh, no, I think I'm good. Right on. So mentioned before that we have a poison chart that we're going to we're going to put up on our Patreon that Lacey's working on and I think I'm going to do this trauma one where we will have a couple different tables that you can roll on. I literally like the idea of dry die drops. I might make a die drop chart with an anatomy figure on there for where the injuries are and what the rolls mean and stuff. I think that could be cool and fun. That could be cool. And dangerous. I like die drops. They're my new Which like yeah, it's they're new hotness for me. Like where it is on the body and then depending on the die roll it could determine if it was, you know, penetrating trauma, right. blunt force trauma, crushing injury, burn. Mm-hmm. There's a fair amount of you lots get, of potential. There's definitely there. at least a D8 of possibilities I, there. Yeah. So those will be going up on our <laughs> Patreon uh, very soon as we work them out. Again, just remember that our Night Witches episodes will be coming out, and our Air Women just made it to the front, and they are fighting in the actual war now. So it's it's mm-hmm. time for some real drama and death and. Yeah, trouble. I don't know. Lots of fun. We've had a lot of fun playing and running that game. We're getting ready to record our third session in a couple weeks here. So more of that to come. We intend to take that one all the way through the war and through the progression that is in the Night Witch's book. So lots of fun there. So check that out. And as you know, we are part of the Gun and Geek Network. So quick promo for Super Geeky Playdate, Episode 71, Chronicles of Darkness, Mind Over Manor. Ty Parallax Bailey brings us through the Alaskan wilderness to a mysterious manner. Will our heroes survive long enough to make dick jokes? The Maddie K Minute returns. So check that out. That's Super Geeky Playdate, episode 71, and you can check them out on the Gun and Geek Network. Big thank you to all of our supporters out there. If you've given us a rating and a review on iTunes or wherever you find us. And a, and a big thank you to our Patreon supporter, Todd Olson. So big thanks to him for help, for supporting the show. More people should be like Todd and support us on Patreon. You can check us our stuff out there. We've got additional material we put out there so as always thanks for hanging out with us and hopefully this will add some more drama and excitement and suspense to your rpgs and we will see you guys next week thanks for listening this has been an episode of just one more fix music has been provided by kevin mcleod you can find him at incompetech.com you can support us at patreon.com slash just one more fix or follow us on twitter at just one more fix 